So, hi there. Um, for everybody here, all, I think, whopping uh, 15 people. My God, I'm, I'm now pony famous. Uh, so, my name is Manatee Outlaw, a.k.a. Tiny Prancing Horse. If you ever um, read 4chan, uh, the pony board, you may also know me as Brand New Right Fag. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I've been a writing for about five years now. Past uh, two years have been uh, semi-professionally. And I say semi because I, I have actually been able to create a Patreon and, and start doing some stuff there. So that's pretty fun. Um, and so basically what this chat is, and I know it's sort of like you just are basically seeing... Uh, <laughs> A, a looping background video that does nothing and then the voice of you know a disembodied head here so whatever whatever but um, the name of this game the idea here for this chat is just to explain some very common problems that happen in writing sorta of how to circumvent that uh, and also really to just be an open Q&A so I'm monitoring the flank stage chat uh, if, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, you want me to talk about something in particular, please, by all means, do so. Uh, just just ping me there. But, uh, yeah, so for the next hour, uh, all we're really going to do is do a little bit of a master class on, you know, how to write good. <laughs> so, so that's about it. So I guess just to initially start off, and I guess I need to get used to the fact that there's a couple second delay in the stream, so just to initially start off, does anybody have any burning questions uh, in regards to writing characters or world building or how do I structure a plot or the hero's journey or any of that good stuff? Or shall I just begin rambling? Let's see. It could be that there's just 15 people. What are we at? 19. 19 whole people. My God. Uh, could just be 19 people asleep. So, all right. Uh, well, while we wait for, oh, CR is typing. I love you, CR. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're fine for rambling. Well, all right. I'm. Um, I'm just gonna then meander on around. So, let's start. Let's start with world building. Let's start at the beginning, right? So, what a lot of people do. Is, is they'll they'll be reading stuff or they'll be consuming media and they'll have a great idea or they'll you know come from come off of a Hiawasa trip and they'll just be like oh my god you know the peyote was great and I have this great idea for magic or I have this great idea for this setting or I had this really awesome like oh my god like I what what if what if it was a Taurus that was a space station that was a sun you know like you come up with this really nice idea and then you try and build a world around this really nice idea. And the problem with that is, is that other people start consuming your media and other people start reading your story or your comic or whatever it is. What is awesome to you is not necessarily awesome to them. So they will start noticing gigantic holes in your writing. And it's, it's sort of at that point where then you're, you're playing catch up to plug these holes because you have your really nice awesome thing and it can be awesome but then because you've tried to build a world around this one awesome thing it started to fall a little flat and so you you I mean you notice this and you see this in a bunch of stuff um, most <laughs> I, I like picking on them because it's it's not really polarizing everybody can just kind of agree that they're bad um, but the most recent three Star Wars films. Um, you know, hey, Dreadnought, nice to have you here, too. Um, but you look at the most recent three Star Wars films, and I'm, I'm picking on them because they're Disney. You know, if, if the mouse wants to have me assassinated, he can, but, I mean, everybody's seen these movies. So you you look at the, at the most recent three Star Wars films, and you see a lot of Mary Sue, you see a lot of Just So Happen, you see a lot of we just happen to be here. Yes, that is a good and correct opinion, Dreadnought. J.J. Abrams did did ruin Star Wars and Star Trek. Um, 
but like for instance and and i'm I, you know if you haven't seen the movies uh good for you but let me just give you like a a brief uh, explanation you know you you have ray who is in the desert who has been abandoned by her parents at such a young age that she doesn't even know who they are um, and all she's ever done is scrounge for technology. And it's very obvious she has not lived outside of probably a 50 square mile, 100 square mile radius of this junk dealer. And, you know, not only is she able to get a junk heap ship flying, but she is able to outfly child soldiers who have been doing this their entire lives so she's able to outfly ace pilots in a ship and she has never flown a ship let alone this specific ship but she's able to do it and it's it's those kind of world building breaks it's those kind of of story breaks that ruins i mean well it ruined the new star wars and it's that kind of stuff that ruins any story any comic anything that you are making that has a narration that has a narrative that has a plot it's going to destroy it so then okay you're over here like okay tiny like what's the deal then so let's talk about and i just want to make sure because i've never used this stream okay so it's just a blue panel so that's cool um so let's just talk about how do i build a world how do i play god here um it is something called the onion method. I do not know if I have made that term up. I have not heard it anywhere else, but I would be really surprised if this is brand new, but it, I call it the onion method. And you start with the most fundamental kernel and you basically build out from the onions. And, and yes, Hex, I don't, the new Luke, the new Luke bothers me. It, it really do, but okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're going to get back on track. So when we're looking at world building, um, the, the very first thing is, is the actual universe. So you have to build the universe before you can build the world. And that makes a lot of sense. Let me just explain here real quick. So you need to tell us in an offhand way, but you need to know yourself. Like this needs to go into your lore Bible. Is the world... Yeah, I'm sorry, is the universe, does it have magic? Does it not have magic? Uh, is the solar, is the, the, the galaxy that they are in a disk galaxy or a globular one? Are they in a dust cloud and there won't be any stars and it's just the local star and that's it? Are there other planets? Is it just one giant planet and a whole ton of meteors and asteroids like who knows but you need to actually build the build the galaxy in the solar system and that is your most basic level of world building which again sounds weird but just follow me here so you have your galaxy is the most basic level your your solar system your universe is the most basic level of world building Think about it as we are building the laws of physics and the laws of nature here. Now we're going to move on to the actual planet. So the planet is now that next little layer of onion around the nexus. And I know you're saying like, well, this isn't this is world building in the literal sense, but just just hold on, you know. Is your planet an ocean world? Is it a bunch of archipelagos and little islands? Is it Pangaea? and you just have one giant supercontinent. It, do you have three Australias and that's it? You know, like, because we have, you know, the Americas and we have Pan-Afro-Eurasia and then there's Australia, maybe it's like that. You need to sit down and say, how is the actual building of, of the continents and the world? And you'll notice that we are starting to sort of build on top of each other. Um, Hold on a second, I'm really sorry. Uh, but there's a reason for it. And the reason for it is, is that now you take your whatevers. Um, now you take your, if you wanted, because I know my audience here, your horses, right? You take your talking horses. Or if you're a furry artist, you take your furries. If you're just a normal person, <laughs> if you're a non-degenerate, then you just take your humans and your elves and your dwarves, whatever it is. And you sprinkle them over the world. And 
what you, and Bloodborne is good good world building. Um, but this is this is more just sort of like a foundational sort of here, here's how we do. So you have your universe and your galaxy and solar system sort of answered. You now have your world sort of answered. When you throw your people on it, the next level is going to be religion. And I know it doesn't matter what you, you think about our actual religions that are on the world, but religions are the nascent form, they are the, the proto-form of governments. Used to be the shaman that would help lead the tribe. Then it was the the priest that would bless the king. Then you even had god priests. And I mean, you 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 look at that in our own history, and that's sort of how you know civilization plays. But the reason why I say religion now, because how your universe is built and how your world is built is going to determine your religions. Let me give you an example. If you have a binary moon system, let's just throw that out there, and you are archipelagos, well then, no one's going to really care about a harvest god. But everyone is going to give a damn about the god of navigation and the god of the ocean and the god of storms. So suddenly your pantheon is completely different just based upon, okay, I have two moons, which means my tides are huge. And I'm an archipelago world, which means I'm not going to be farming potatoes. I'm going to be farming oysters. So you, you suddenly now, because you are doing the onion method, each layer is building on each other. You have your galaxy, your universe, your, your local star cluster. Then you have what is your world and how does that look. Then you throw your people on there and the most ancient of your people are going to try and answer these questions and they're going to turn to religion to do so. You know, the reason why the village got flooded is because Amun-Ra, you know, the moon god, the elder moon god, which is the big moon, not the little moon, which is his little brother, um, got angry at us because we killed dolphins when they were migrating. And so now suddenly the, the village was flooded. And it's not, well, no, actually the two moons are, are orbiting now at the same time, which means it's a double tide. And it just so happened that you had a storm push through, so you had storm surge plus double tide, and then your village got flooded. Nobody's going to think like that. Especially if you're looking in, in terms of, like, the proto-ancient way of doing things. Um, and, and that's fine. Like, so Star Pony says, you know, in the Star Pony Kingdom, the main religion is Christianity, and that's fine. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian as well, and that's good. Um, but you, you need to tie those two together you need to have that thread so if you do want to tie it to a real world religion which you absolutely can you need to sort of explain why there is that thread and and it could be anything from just well you know in 1085 a monk got teleported to equestria and he was pretty persuasive and he gave really good head paths so christianity took off or it could be you know i don't know like i think there was one what was it conversion bureau way back in the day that was like we're just turning people into ponies so then they would just probably keep their religions or or whatever but but you get my point if we're doing the layer method we're doing the layers you have your celestial answers first then you have your your geographical answers next and then you put people on top of it whatever those people are elves dwarves humans are they ponies? Are they griffins? I mean, it doesn't matter, but, you know, people are people. So you put your people there, and they're going to try and answer that. The next layer on top of religion is actual government. And, and this is, and, and you see this even in the modern, well, not modern day, you see this in our normal history, where you go from being rulers that are either implicitly or explicitly God or the son of God or knighted by God to lead to now a more secular, okay, we're going to vote him in or okay, you know, he's part of the noble house and so he stays. I mean, and, you know, 
don't don't shirk away from houses of nobility because the last time I checked, the UK has the entire House of Lords, and the only way that entire legislative body can grow or shrink is if the Queen gives you a sheet of paper. So <laughs> it's out there. Um, so don't don't shy away from that, or don't simply say like, well, if I'm t if I'm making my world take place in a more modern era, then we don't have lords and nobility. You absolutely can. Um, but the every layer exists on the layer below it. You do not have today, no matter where you are, no matter what nation it is, you do not have a government that does not have the implicit or explicit approval of the local religion. And that could be anything from, you know, the imams blessing, you know, the the uh, the Islamic Republic. It could be anything from old school, the Roman Pope coming over there and, and putting a crown on your head. It could be anything from Shinto priests that are blessing your temple and, you know, I mean, whatever it is, you do not rule without the head pat from the religion. You do not rule without the head pat from the priest. And so now let's just take a look at that from our fictional world. Remember, two moons, one sun, archipelagos. You know, we don't really care about the harvest god because the harvest god isn't really there. You know, grains may be a luxury. You know, but I really care about the fishing god and the navigation god and the god of oceans and the god of storms. And that's my main pantheon. And I don't care about anything else. So if you start saying, well, how would people arrange themselves in a society? Maybe they are nomadic. And maybe you see that a majority of societies travel in large flotillas because no one island can really sustain them so they travel from island chain to island chain sort of moving and moving so that's a great question dreadnought and the answer and the beauty of the onion method is no you do not need a complete history it you don't need that and and the reason for it is because you are building a scaffolding that you can hang anything on you don't have to sit there and and do the tens of thousands of years of history because you can literally look at any point in history or any group of people and say what would make sense and then you throw it out there so let's give an, let's let's continue this example so your tropical people are traveling from island to island and they're on you know flat rafts that have the the little dinghy that goes out like the po the Polynesians do and the people from Hawaii the the native Hawaiians they're big long canoes and they've got that outrider and, and like but they're traveling in flotillas and that's all fine and then suddenly you see like a, a flotilla of yeah the outriggers that's I don't know what it's called the little pontoon thing but and then maybe you have a couple of them that are like, I'm going to go explore. And they head north. And the very first people that they come across are people whose ships are made to break ice. And they look at that, and it's, a, it's just a fishing ship. But they look at that and they say, oh my god, they're all warriors, we need to run away. And meanwhile, you know, Sven is over there going, hinger, binger, boing, and dergen. You know, like just watching these people just run you know like you're just like well, okay i guess you don't want to trade fine be that way you know you you but i didn't have to write that just because i know for a fact that the world is an archipelago and i know how you know seasons work and that the poles will probably be colder than the equator if i ever need to bring other nations or other people or other species to bear I can just drop them somewhere on the planet and say, this is probably how you're going to develop. Like, you're, you'll probably develop like this. Now, the god of storms for the equator could all be hurricanes, and so that's their big deal. And the god of storms for people that live on the poles is a completely different beast. And it's like, no, no, like, you, you might have some very mild hurricanes and you just need to, to shelter, but 
No, if there's a if the storm god is angry and you're up north, you need to be in the ocean because if you're not, you're going to be frozen right into port and all of your ship's holes are going to break. And you need to not do that. And and but but that's the thing is that I'm not I'm not writing a complete history, but I'm giving complete histories where it makes sense and where it needs to go. So you start with your galactic celestial baseline then you do what is the world and how is that built and then once you do that you get your religion once you get your religion we're and this is where we we didn't really um hit but you you get your society so society how would what would be the hallmarks of a good king or a good president or prime minister or whatever if your entire nation is a flotilla you know, maybe a good king is not somebody that can lead to war. Maybe a good king is a is a logistics guy. And just by the fact that, you know, King King Amit Kamen, you know, I don't know why I'm on an Egyptian kick, but we're just gonna do it. King Amit Kamen over here is able to manage the logistics of a thousand ships. He's going to be remembered for the rest of time. He's managing a thousand ships, and he just has an abacus. This man is insane. You know, like, holy crap. And and maybe martial prowess isn't important at all. You know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, if you want to look at the religions, you know, okay, again, maybe the, the, the uh, shamans and the witches and the wizards and whatnot and the magic people are the ones that figure out hey we need to move from this island to another one because we're starting to deplete the natural resources here and if we stay here for another season or another moon or whatever it is we're gonna start starving you get and this is all stuff I have not thought about this at all but you get to suddenly build an incredibly rich history and I've done no work like I've done zero work. I've literally just said um, they're they're in a they're in a normal spiral arm galaxy. Uh, they have one sun and two moons. I haven't even talked about the rest of the of the celestial local solar system. One sun, two moons, and they're an archipelago world. And now suddenly we have diverse societies, diverse religions, diverse ways of building ships. You know, we can figure out what their diet is going to look like. We can figure out what's going to be important to them. None of them will know how to ride a horse, but all of them would know how to swim, right? Maybe riding isn't important, and maybe riding doesn't exist. Maybe they do. I think it's what the Singapores did, uh, the Singaporean people, um, way back when, and they used knots, like physical tied knots, to write with and how you tied a knot and how many knots were there were, were telling stories i think it was it was either singapore or chinese one of the two but you get to do all of that stuff and i've done zero work like i've done n no work whatsoever and actually like <laughs> actually writing out the history or anything because i can do it on demand if I notice that there is a loophole, if I notice that there is a gap that needs to be filled, if I have some people who are reading my work or enjoying my media and they're suddenly like, hey, tiny, this doesn't make sense, because I've world built like this, I can just literally extrapolate it out and say, okay, well, this is what would make sense, and you're done. World, continents, uh, so I say world, continents, religion, but you know, the, the universe, right? And then your world and how it's built, the religions, then the governments, you have one last layer on this onion and then you get to the person and the last layer on this onion is the family the family is the smallest unit the smallest discrete unit of this entire onion so the family will structure itself within a society follow a religion live on the planet you know like the family unit is the very last outside of the onion and and so you get to sit there and say well uh is fishing and and deep sea fishing incredibly dangerous and you have men that go out and there's like a 20 percent chance they will never come back so 
women don't really form long-term relationships and men just sort of show up and that's it and they trade their fish and they trade their food and say hi to their kids and then they go back to the ocean for another four or five months do you have because you're doing flotillas do you just have very large clan families and so you are child number 37 out of the entire family and it's just it is what it is um yeah okay there you go uh i've heard of guns germs and steel i have not read it um but yeah it's probably the exact same thing uh but the family unit is the smallest cohesive discrete unit of the onion method so you get to determine whether or not like okay is it is it multiple men and women in some weird polyamorous well, i say weird but in some polyamorous relationship and it's just however many kids get out or however many kids that get out do you have uh do you have monogamy and that's it do you just not really understand what the concept of marriage is you know you you get to determine sort of what is normal there and again it's going to vary based upon where you are in the world and what types of stressors and problems that family unit would be fighting with you know it's it's one of those things where like you know you you look at ancient humans and we traveled in family family packs basically and then one family pack would would meet another family pack or one family tribe would meet another family tribe and there would be a couple months of well we're going to intermarry and we're going to intermingle and we're going to trade and all this other cool stuff and you're going to that mountain okay well we're going to this valley see you in a few years and then you split and then and then there you go so it's it's one of those things where it's like okay you know is is that how it works or, or what's going on if you had major flotillas how would you have one major flotilla meet another major flotilla how would that trade work what would happen there etc etc the reason why i have said all of that for the past 30 minutes is because once you have done the onion method and remember, your super cool idea, your super cool thing, can be within this onion method. That's fine. Stick it wherever it needs to go. Once you are done with this onion method, you can take your main characters, and you can pick them up, and you can drop them wherever you want. And they will have an incredibly rich backstory without you having to write it. You don't have to do anything. If I pick up a, 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 an elder son and I drop it into this universe, then maybe the reason why he has, you know, big, big kahunas or big kahunas and, and big chutzpah is because he has been alive for 45 years in, a, in an industry where you have a 20% fatality rate every time you walk out. So he is a living legend. You know, okay, so then that's why he's the patriarch. Or maybe it's it's one of those things where, okay, well, you know, I'm I'm daughter number 48. Nobody really cares. I'm the middle child. And I have seven moms and four dads, and it's okay, it's whatever, and, and it's my job to make the, uh, oh, I don't know, the, the oyster racks. So I, you know, every day I go out and I repair the oyster racks and check on the oyster beds and this and that and the other. Done. And, and, and you can just take your main characters and you can drop them into this and they have just pre-baked in before you get into is this guy an asshole or is this guy, you know, a secret magician or whatever. Before you get into any of that, they have a working, living, breathing family unit. They have a working, living, breathing uh, society, a working and living, breathing religion on a living planet within an active solar system that would give them deities and gods and different types of good luck charms and different types of stigmas and different types of everything like that's that's what the onion method does and you'll be able to see i'm not saying that if, if it's if it's crap if it's if it's a crap thing that they haven't done it but you will very much be able to see like okay have the writers actually thought about the world or are they just trying to sell plastic ponies 
And, like, if you look at MLP, the writers actually thought about the world. They actually sat down and said, okay, how does the universe work? Well, there's a sun and a moon. Okay, well, let's talk about, you know, how is it laid out? Oh, okay, well, here's the map for Equestria. Okay, let's talk about religion. Well, would you look at that? A sun and a moon deity. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like you could just go down the list, and you see that they have hit the the check mark on the onion method. And then you you take your ponies, you take your characters, and you just sprinkle them. Well, I mean, throughout Ponyville, sure, but you just sprinkle them, and suddenly they have rich backstories. And and you're good. And it's not suddenly. It's it's a very, you know, it's an intentional thing. So, there you go. That's world building. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just, I see people typing. I'd be happy to, but I know there's like a two or three second delay, so it is what it is. Um, that's the Onion method of world building. <clears throat> Highly recommend you do it. And it's super easy. And you get to see what makes sense and what breaks while you're still building the world. If you have, um, if you have magic in your world, for example, uh, and you you don't have high technology you get to explain at that fundamental level sort of why because we're talking about the physics um, if you have magic and you do have high technology then you basically get to explain sort of how magic tech works or maybe magic doesn't work with high technology maybe because it's cold forged steel or iron it just dissipates magic and it can't hold a magical charge so you have like this weird like well everything is magic because magic's so much easy to do but like if you want to be super rugged and you want overkill then i guess you buy a dwarven made engine as well as a backup generator but like when have we ever had a magic storm that bad that it's knocked out the transmission towers like Whatever, but but you get to you get to sort of build that. Um, Stephanie's okay. Post apocalyptic Earth. Um, that's good. All right, I'll I will have to I will have to read that a little bit a little bit more depth. Um, but okay, let's talk about characters. Uh, so there are two there are two ways to absolutely destroy all of the hard work you have done up until this point. Um, and I'm assuming that you, you've done the onion method and you've built everything and everything is good and, and that's all fine. The two ways to, to destroy everything that you have done up until this point is you hand your characters either A, an idiot ball, or B, a Mary Sue goblet. It's one of the two. There, are, there is nothing different. And let me, let me give you first the caveat here. If your character is a comic or a comedic relief character and he is supposed to be an idiot and that is ingrained into whoever he or she is, then this does not apply to them. This applies to normal people that you are basically being a lazy writer and don't want to don't want to actually write out the 2 or 3 or 4,000 words that would explain what's going on. So Let's talk about the Mary Sue. We can go back to Star Wars for that because that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, so Derpy. Yeah, Derpy is kind of like she's comedic relief. Uh, it's not necessarily idiot. It's more klutz, which is a, a, a fine line to go through. Um, but but yeah, like Derpy. Like you wouldn't handing Derpy an idiot ball is not out of the way for the character. Um, but let's let's go back to Star Wars real quick. So uh, the Mary Sue. Uh, I am a a desert scavenger that has probably never left the the county, if we would even call it that, the state of of where I live, and where I live is just desert, and I've been abandoned. And it's lucky that I even know how to read, let alone speak fluently, because it's very obvious I was just an urchin that was abandoned. Um, but Thank God the writers handed me this Mary Sue goblet and I can drink deeply and I can outfly TIE Fighters. Uh, trained child soldiers that have been doing this since birth and have probably flown hundreds if not thousands of combat missions at this point. Thank God all of my desert scrounge... Yes, 
Dreadnought. This is why Ray is a terrible character. And you can go through and you can see every time where if they wanted to explain this, it would have taken minutes of screen time or a rewriting of the script. And they just handed Ray the Mary Sue goblet and said, drink deep, here's Popeye's spinach, here's everything you do. You know, you just just go for it and and that is why Ray is a terrible character. Um, so, just use, just use the last three Star Wars movies as exactly that. You know, you, you don't see... Like, I was really hopeful that Finn was going to have this great redemptive arc and that he was going to be, like, a main character. And I also don't know why Finn wasn't the one flying the Millennium Falcon when that started because he's the actual trained soldier and probably has fucked around in a couple TIE fighters before. Like, he's actually been from multiple planets. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but, but, but you get my point, though, is, is that every time... And, and when you are a writer or you are doing uh, comic panels or you are doing something and you hit a point that would be incredibly difficult to explain, the knee-jerk reaction is to hand them the Mary Sue goblet. Don't do that. Do not. I have had scenes in my story, and the story I write is They Are Small, S-M-O-L, I have had scenes in They Are Small that was supposed to be like a three or four hundred word scene that have gone to six thousand words. And I've just had to break it up over multiple chapters. Because it would do everyone, your reader and your characters, a disservice if you just said, and then magically. For instance, and, and this is true, I don't know, I mean, I'm speaking to a bunch of Canadians, and I'm, I'm from a red state down south, so here you go, your mileage may vary. Nobody can just pick up a firearm and just use it. Nobody. I don't, I don't care. It's, it's not the case. But you see in movies and in comics and in books that just people... People will be like, oh, well, I'm a librarian for 20 years, but I'm going to pick up this this AR-15 or this AK-47 or this, you know, Desert Eagle, which has incredible kickback, by the way. I don't know if you've ever shot one, but good God. Uh, I'm 6'3", and I have trouble keeping that thing on point. And I'm just going to, I'm going to kill all these mercenaries that have invaded the library. And just bang, 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 roll, shoot, flip. Yeah, and, and, and on one hand, you're kind of like, well, how do I shoot a gun? And then on the other hand, I'm kind of like, do you know where the safety is on that weapon? Do you know if it's engaged or not? How do you clear a jam? Jams do happen. How do you know when you are, are out of ammo? Okay, well, so you see that the, the, the fucking breach is open, so do you know how to reload it? Where's your magazine drop? Once you drop the magazine and you stick it back in, how do you re-engage the bolt? Oh, well... Shoot, I sure hope you aren't trained on AKs, which are different than ARs. God help you if you have some weird post-Soviet German gun. So, like, but that's my point. Is, is you see them hand the Mary Sue goblet because writing that your librarian main character, when somebody else killed one of the mercenaries and a gun fell in front of her, writing that she cowered under her desk or just threw the gun at someone, or tried to run away, is not the kind of character that you want. It's not the kind of... And, and, and then there, there is your point. There is the hubris that begins the fall of the series. Having Ray, you know, just be a wrench lackey to Finn, as Finn is trying to fix the ship, because Finn is the only one that knows how starships even work, and having Ray strap into the passenger seat while Finn flies the Millennium Falcon and understands how TIE fighters fight, so he's going to go through all the blind spots to save them? That's not the type of hero that they wanted. They didn't want somebody who was passive and who was realistic and who would have to have personal growth. So instead, you just have Ray be able to do everything. And then, in just some little cheeky, cheeky-breaky sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek, you just have, uh, have Ray and Finn remark how amazing Ray is that she was able to do that. And it was at that point that I just started drinking in the theater. But that's beside the point. 
and we don't talk about the restraining orders I have. So there's your there's your there's your Mary Sue goblet. Now I also talked about an idiot ball. The idiot ball. Let's talk about the idiot ball because a lot of people don't know what an idiot ball is and a lot of people don't actually think about the idiot balls. The idiot ball is when you have a character who up until this point has been sane, who the audience has been able to follow, who has done things that are incredibly understandable, suddenly becomes an idiot. Just the dumbest person in the room, the dampest light bulb in the sock drawer. You just, what the hell is wrong with you? Why would you do that? And, and that's so, so an idiot ball. Let me give you an example. Because, hilariously enough, never watched Game of Thrones, never read Game of Thrones. I don't get the Tyrion Lannister reference. Sorry, buddy. Um, let's just do this example real here, real quick. You are, are writing or you're comic paneling or any of that other good stuff uh, a, a detective. And he has two weeks left on, on the force before he can retire. And all of his friends and family and, and even his co-workers are like, let's just get you desk duty, John. You've been, you've been on the force for 35 years. Like, let's just get you desk duty. You got two weeks, then you got your pension and you're done. And he's like, no, I want to I wanna go and I want to just do beat cop work and just sort of walk around. And so, okay, we're going to give him a little, a little baby root and just let him have fun. And, and, and then just that's that. And then... Suddenly you're like, well, I want him to uh, under, un uncover a, a, a giant drug operation. And then, oh, well, there's no time for him to call for backup. So he kicks down the door and runs in. And I'm over here like, you just established to me and to everyone else that this is a man with everything to lose. And you just established to me and to everyone else that he is old and that he doesn't want to do this. You know, like that he just wants to sort of have a little bit of fun. And you just established to me and to everybody else, you know, like, that he's been doing this for 35 years so he would know what the sane thing to do is. But then you hand him the idiot ball, because you are the writer or you're the screenwriter or you're the director. You hand him an idiot ball and you say, I need action. So I need you to ignore the fact that you could radio for help. I need you to ignore the fact that you could probably come back here tomorrow and these people would be doing the same shit. And you could just literally go back to, to the precinct and tell everybody. And then I need you to ignore the fact that you are just one man and you don't have any backup. I need you to ignore all of these things. That your wife wants you just to take vacation. That you're not, you know, that you yourself don't want to do anything too crazy. That all this stuff. I need you to ignore all of this shit. And I need you to just 100% do this. Because this is going to create fake action. And this is going to create fake tension. And it's that kind of stuff that destroys a character. It destroys... It destroys everything that you're doing in the story. Because it also sets up false... What's the word I'm looking for? False cliffs. You know? It's one of those things where it's like... We, we call it plot armor. Where it's like, ah, there's, there's no way that Rey was going to die. Because she's the main character, so it's impossible for her to die. Um, it's kind of like that. You, you are basically, by giving an otherwise professional character an idiot ball, you are making it so that they are going to put the rest of your crew in a precarious position that could have been easily avoided. And there will never be any repercussions to that one character for their idiocy because the you the writer needed it to happen so just like you look through your 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 popular media and and my favorite one to pick on and I'll, I'll give it uh, you know I'll give it again to to Star Wars here my favorite one to pick on are the stormtroopers oh my god like I, I love you guys but you you as the writer you as the screenwriter you as the storyteller are going to tell me that trained child soldiers cannot kill a group of like five people and not just like a few of them like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people cannot shoot like five people stormtroopers can't shoot for crap 
but but I mean, but you also see other things where it's like like look at the Mandalorian, and I love the Mandalorian, and the Mandalorian is fine, and don't get me wrong here, but you look at like the Mandalorian, like one of the more recent episodes where, uh, and this is minor spoilers, but where they steal a ship for some Mandalorian people, they steal a ship, and that's all I'm going to say about that that episode. Um, and you have stormtroopers guarding an armory, and they don't have any heavy weapons, and. So they're guarding this armory, and the Mandalorian just rolls a grenade down the hallway and kills everyone. And I'm just sitting here like, you're guarding an armory. <laughs> and you, no one decides, let's use the shit in the armory to kill the people that are boarding the ship. It's an idiot ball. They have handed an idiot ball to every soldier, to the commanding officers, to the admirals, to the pilots, to everyone. They handed this idiot ball to them and said, we need you to be so incompetent and inept that we can just knock you down like, like paper mache. And, and I, I saw that entire sequence play out during The Mandalorian, and it was just one of the few episodes that I've seen, but I, I saw that entire sequence play out, and I'm like, why is this filled with tension? For, I mean, and for Pete's sake, and I'm trying, you know, that's not what I wanted to say, but for Pete's sake, The Mandalorian even has armor that can reflect blaster shot. Why is it, why are they cowering? Why are they running away? Why are they taking cover? <laughs> like what what tension actually exists in this episode if you hand everyone idiot balls and you get well I mean and, and, and CR I get you that writers lacking tactical experience but if the writers are writing that the main character's armor reflects the main bad guy's way of killing people it's like I'm immune to bullets but I'm still gonna take cover because you're shooting at me. Woo. <laughs> I, I'm immune to bullets, but I'm still gonna hide. You know, I'm, I am, this is a friendly 12 minute warning. Heck you, I won't do what you suggest to me. But all right, yeah, we'll wrap it up, no worries. Um, this is just something where you're, you're just sitting here and you're like, you are trained child soldiers guarding an armory and you refuse to use any of, of, of the stuff there. You have admirality and senior officers that are not only incompetent, but displaying cowardice. Which, even in our own military, would mean that you'd probably lose your commission, if not just be, be outright ignored. And just due to the, the nature of, of military operations. And you have heroes who know their own sort of quote-unquote superpowers, but we need to build tension so everybody gets idiot hall. Well, yeah, on one hand, aren't the gaps in armor still vulnerable? You are absolutely correct, Combo Breaker. And you know what you do? You just present the sides of yourself that don't have gaps. Or better yet, you just get armor shielding. Just get you a shield. Get you a little Captain America shield. And you now have an entire circle. You have a buckler that can't be killed. And, and I'm just... It's just one of those things where I know I'm ranting a little bit at this point. But... You see how much poorer this series is when you ha make someone a Mary Sue or you give everyone idiot balls. And to actually have made an episode where the stormtroopers are competent and they bring out, I'm going to call it the bolter because, you know, Warhammer, Warhammer 40k, you know, they bring out the heavy bolters. And as soon as the elevator opens, they just start grenade spamming into the elevator. And all of this other stuff, instead of doing what would be sane, and therefore actually creating real tension, we're just going to chop it down into a 30 minute episode, so I need some real easy outs, so we're just going to make it seem like this is a big deal, when it really actually isn't. And that's about it. Uh, so... Don't do it. Don't do it. It's going to be harder. You are going to have to go back. And you're going to have to figure out where am I going? What am I doing? Where do I want this to go? You are going to have to sit down and you're going to have to draw that entire line. Exactly. Combo breaker. 
perfect. Let's build life or death tension in a prequel. <laughs> like, like, you can't. You cannot. You know? It, 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 is, it is what it is. But, um, Slanesh is the worst chaos god. I'm going to go on record for that. Um, Malal is the best chaos god. If that gets me banned, too bad. Um, <laughs> ah, deepest lore there. Um, you are going to have to really figure out where you want to go and how you want to get there. And it might be, and this is the reason why people hand out idiot balls or they hand out the Mary Sue goblet for their, their characters to drink deeply from. The reason why they do that is because oftentimes you will have to go back and rewrite what you have already produced. If you have reached a stage where the the only two options you see to resolve it within this chapter are Idiot Ball or Mary Sue Goblet, your two options are either rewrite where you were beforehand to make it so that you don't even get there, or sit down and power through it. That's right. You soldier through it, you find the right tone, you, you just straight up do it. Uh, CR asks, are there points of a story you're writing where what occurs in this part of the story is important to character? Scene itself feels clunky or boring. Uh, you rewrite it. You, you figure out what, what is the point you are trying to get across. So CR, what are you trying to say in that scene? Did your main character get betrayed? Did your main character get embarrassed? Did your main character get physically or emotionally hurt? Did it lose something important to them? You, is, if you take that kernel out, then you can change the scene and how that works. But you want to keep the part that is important to the character and the later behaviors. And it usually falls into one of those broad categories. You know, the, my main character has a victory, my main character has a defeat, it has been hurt, uh, love lost, or love gained, or lost something precious. And usually it falls within one of those categories. Take that, say, this is what I really want, flesh that out, like really just straight up say, okay, I want the main character to have lost his mother's locket, and that was the only thing he had of her, and it is now totally gone, and it absolutely crushes her. And then you say, okay, well, maybe a bar fight isn't where it needs to be. Maybe instead of a bar fight, maybe it needs to happen this way, or maybe it needs to happen that way. Or if, you know, how do I want this to set up? You take your kernel and you rewrite around it. What you don't do is, is you don't keep the scene and then try and shove something into it. That is the square peg round hole. You, you change the scene and you change what's going on, and that might mean rewriting, you know, it might mean you have to go back a chapter or two and they don't actually go to the town yet they're stuck on a cliff. It might mean that instead of